not that he was going to be there for any length of time, you would definitely want to put a pipeline in, and they didn't want to do that. Um, if you want to look at the financial health of these companies, it's very, very interesting indeed. I could sit here all night and bore you with financial figures, but I'm going to do something very quick because it's simple and easy, and it's a, it's a good metric for anybody to look at. One of the first things I look at when I go into um, financial statements is the cash flow statement. And I look for free cash flow. And the reason I do that is because cash flow, just cash flow, you can massage and be extraordinarily creative with cash flow. You can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things with it and make it pretty much say what you want to say to some extent. With free cash flow, on the other hand, it's very difficult. And it's much harder to fudge those numbers. So I always go in and look at free cash flow. <coughs> so CapEx means capital expenditure. So let's take a look. I picked initially five companies, and I picked them because they were typically shale companies. And they only have onshore operations and only in shale. And so it's a lot harder to look at if you wanted to include somebody like an ExxonMobil or a Shell. They have operations all over the world, and it's hard to tease out the information that's just on shales. And I wanted to see what are the, the companies that just do shales? What are they, what do their numbers look like? What do their financials look like? As you can see, this is all their capital expenditure here. Since 2010, these five companies alone have spent $56 billion on capital expenditure, drilling and completing wells. This is how much money they've made. None of them have broken even. Almost every one of them is deteriorated since 2010. It's going down. So um, this one, Chesapeake, is very interesting because, as you can see, the free cash flow there was trending in the right direction and then took a nosedive again. And interestingly enough, in this area here, that's where they sold about $13 billion in assets. So um, there's a real problem here. You have a, a tremendous amount of expenditure, and, and I've since pulled the numbers on quite a number of other companies like Cabot, EOG, Intana. Um, some of those have other operations outside of shale, but still deteriorating cash flow across the board. So they're not making money. This is actually a picture of what shale looks like. Actually, I don't need to show you that. That's mainly for the Marcellus because you already know what it looks like. You live here. And these are pad sites where I live. Each one of these red dots is a pad site with multiple wells on it. And I live right about there. Um, and so you can see it covers 23 counties in Texas. It's pretty large. So the drilling treadmill. This is a classic. Example, I could sit here all night and give you example after example in every single show play of this very thing, but I decided to choose it from my own hometown. Um, in 2008, the city of Fort Worth received $50 million in gas drilling revenues on 44 wells. Sounds great, right? They were all telling us that we were going to be, no kidding, shale That's what they called it. By 2012, and it had deteriorated pretty much in a straight line. We had a little blip in 2010, but pretty much uh, in a straight line, it had deteriorated, and the city received 23 million, but now we have 400 gas wells within the city proper. So we had a 50% decline, over 50% decline <coughs> in revenues, but we had a tenfold growth in the number of wells. That is classic. That's classic. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you about this all night long. <coughs> and that's what happens with shale. They have not been able <coughs> to keep production stable for a meaningful period of time in any shale play today. The only shale play in the U.S., shale gas play in the U.S. that's still on a growth trajectory and actually it's plateaued now, plateaued about six months ago, is Marcellus. So we expect to see that because it usually will plateau for about six to eight months and then you start seeing a decline. Every other shale play is in decline. Now the industry will tell you, well, that's because the price went down. That is only, that does not account for all of this. It does not account for a tenfold growth in wells and not being able to even keep um, revenues even with a tenfold growth of wells. See, the numbers don't work. So um, it's a little bit problematic. Um, if you look at the production of all the shale plays in the U.S., industry would have to drill 7,000 new wells per annum at a cost of $42 billion, and those numbers will rise each year because they have to move out of sweet spots and into more marginal acreage. 7,000 wells, 42 billion per annum, just to keep production flat. That's beyond the capacity of the industry at present. So, as you can see, it's, it's, it's a problem. And um, I think.
think I will, I've got a few more slides, but I think we might in there. Actually, you might be interested in this. This is a satellite uh, picture of the Bakken Formation. The Bakken Formation is out in the middle of nowhere in the prairie. And um, these are <coughs> natural gas players because the price of natural gas has dropped so low that the industry deems it unprofitable to even take the gas, so they're just burning it off. Now, I think there's a very good argument to be made there that that is irresponsible use of, of our natural resources. Um, it's enough production to power all the homes in Chicago and Washington for years. This is the Eagle Ford right here in South Texas. Again, you're out in the middle of the Chihuahua Desert, essentially. And um, it looks like a city. And again, those are just natural gas flares. We're the only first world country that still allows flaring. Um, it's an antiquated process and should not be allowed, but it is being allowed, and they are wasting um, natural gas in, at an incredible rate. Um, so, why don't I open up to questions now? Yeah, <laughs> Southwestern claimed, I think it was 2.3. Um, interestingly enough, when you go in and pull the production history from the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission, you find that there's never been a single well in the Fayetteville play that will surpass 1.7 BCF. Most of them, the average is 0.5. So these companies were telling investors, we're getting averages on these wells of 2.6 and 2.3 when in fact they were getting averages of 0.5. We found that across the board in every shale play. Um, what we found when we pulled the actual production history from the various states was that operators, <coughs> I'm so sorry, <coughs> operators have overestimated reserves by a minimum of 100% and in some places as much as 4 to 500%. Uh, why did they do that? Because they could go in, they could book those because of the rule change from the SEC, they could book those reserves immediately and borrow money from them. So we now know that there's been a tremendous amount of money. I, I couldn't tell you an exact dollar figure, but there's been an enormous sum of money that has been borrowed on shale assets that either do not exist or will never be commercially viable to extract. It's a little bit of a problem. So I'm glad you asked that question. I meant to bring that up in my talk. Yes, sir. Where were the regulators all the time that the, the uh, reserves were being sold off? Um, well, the reserves being sold off. I'm not sure. Well, they were saying that basically they were taking write-offs by buying the reserves. You know, they. Uh, no, they 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 bought the assets. Then they had to write write them down because they right. paid too much. Where were the regulators when that was being done? You're saying that that was an illegal. No, that's not illegal. That's not illegal. No, no, sir. Okay. That's not illegal. That's just stupid. Yeah, if you're managing sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing illegal about it. I was stupid like they No, I didn't mean it that way. It, that is, it, the last thing you want as management of any company is an impairment charge. You don't want to write down assets. And um, so what it says is when you have a company like BHP Billiton that goes in and pays $4 billion and a mere 18 months later they write off over 50%, what that immediately tells everyone is that you did not do your due diligence very well. And interestingly enough, <coughs> the mergers and acquisitions, by the way, um, <coughs> the M&A, mergers and acquisitions, the deals, the shale deals that have been generating all this fee income for the investment banks, they have now taken a plunge. 
Uh, the first six months of 2013, uh, M&A deals were all 52%. The private equity money that was going into so the hedge funds and other private equity groups that was going into sales was soft off over 90% year over year. Um, so this income generation for the banks is, has fallen off dramatically, which tells me, um, I'm going out on a limb here, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but I sort of do. If, if you're not making money, you're going to be looking for the next greatest thing, and um, so I suspect that's exactly what the banks are doing right now. They're looking for the next shares, um, and these companies are beginning to scramble for money. I'm seeing some very interesting um, um, projects, we'll say, mm -hmm. coming out of the companies to raise money. One more question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm North sorry, but we really need to have well, the over at a microphone. So, this will help us a great oh, deal. By the time I get over there, you'll all be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> the wind farm that was put in Northwest Iowa, mm -hmm. was I think it was Cal Energy that put it there. Okay. And I said, why would you invest in it if you're not getting a return for the amount of money it costs to invest? He said it was strictly due to the fact that the government backed the whole thing. So, okay, is your point that well, um, I mean, renewables are getting less subsidies because... Percent. I mean, we're talking the amount of... I mean, if this goes bad, as you say it's going to go bad, how long do you think wind energy is going to pick up the slack? Okay, I'm not. I, I think I know where you're going here, but let me let me back up because I think there are a couple of points that ought to be made here. First of all, um, there's there's a lot in the uh, mainstream press about renewables getting subsidies, and indeed they do, but they do not get subsidized anywhere near what oil and gas gets subsidized globally. Oil and gas is one of the largest subsidized um, entities on the planet. If you take it globally, I mean in the U.S. and globally. Uh, so, the amount of money um, that are going into subsidies for renewables are, are I think, one-sixth of what the oil and gas industry gets in subsidies. One-sixth. So, even though we may hear a lot from, from uh, the mainstream media about, you know, you know renewables are bad because they're being subsidized, well, nobody's being subsidized as much as the oil and gas industry. And, in fact, they trot out the regulations of the world and make them testify before the Senate um, every couple of years to explain why they still need these subsidies and they, they you know, it's just all uh, a big kind of circus and a nice show. So I wanted to get that out of the way because um, uh, renewables are subsidized and indeed they need to be subsidized in my opinion because we need to make, and, and I think this is, I'm hoping the second part of what I'm about to say is going to answer your question or, or statement. The reason I do this is because, and the reason I, I really am interested in shares is because I saw something that, I, well, I saw two things. I saw shareholder destruction. And with my background, I'm a former investment banker and I, I, I was a financial consultant for years. I'm sick of, of shareholders getting screwed. I'm tired of it. And we need financial reform and we didn't get it with Dodd Frank. It was so watered down, it, it just, we didn't get it. Okay, so that's one reason I'm standing up here tonight. The other reason is, and you don't have to even talk about climate change, you don't have to talk about, I don't even want to talk about that, I want to set all that stuff aside. The point is, hydrocarbons are finite. There's no way around that. We can argue, if you want, whether we run out next week or, or 100 years from now. It really doesn't matter, we're going to run out. So, if, you're, if the bedrock of the entire global economic system is energy, which it is, um, how do you make a transition from moving away from a, a, that, a, a bedrock based on a commodity that is finite and is going to run out at some time. How do you do that in, with the most stability and the least amount of destruction? In my opinion, and maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, um, you do it by taking some of those subsidies that we're giving to the fossil fuel industry and you start pouring them into R&D for renewables. That would make a huge difference. things like shale gas, instead of exporting shale gas, and I didn't get into exportation of shale gas, and, and I can, I'm certainly willing to talk more about that if you guys are interested. Um, instead of exporting our shale gas to China, and the reason they want to do that is for the spread, it's to save alien balance sheets. I mean, there's no doubt about it. 
um, they can extract pipe, refine, and ship that gas to Asia for nine dollars and get paid eighteen. Here they're getting paid three dollars and fifty cents for the same amount of gas. So it's just business, and that's the way it should be. This is just business. But it's, but don't wrap yourself in a red, white, and blue flag, and you know, call energy independence because that's just that's just rubbish. That's just playing well into the uh, current political environment. But it has no basis in reality. So how do we make that transition and make it as smooth as possible? Well, you do it with pouring money into renewables, R&D, maybe there's other things, maybe there is cold fusion, I don't know. Now they're saying, MIT's telling us that, um, that there may be something to that and it's based on the quantum mechanical, the quantum mechanical level. I'm not smart enough to go into that. But, um, so we need to be looking at research and development of other things. And then we need to use that shale gas, instead of shipping it to China to grow the, the Asian economy, we need to use it here, and we need to use it as a price buffer. So if the wind isn't blowing and the sun's not shining, and you need to keep that price stability in utility generation prices, you can do it with shale gas. That's how it ought to be used in my opinion. Um, can you talk a little bit about the economics of wet versus dry gas? Um, well, yes. Yeah. Okay, so dry gas is, um, is well, let's um, wet gas. <laughs> wet gas is natural gas that has uh, natural gas liquids included. So you have ethane, propane, other things like that. Now, interestingly enough, when they started to tank the price for dry gas, um, they immediately, a lot of companies like Range Resources, for instance, um, they came out and said, we're going into NGLs, natural gas liquids, and, um, and therefore we're going to, you know, we're going to do really well. Well, they didn't do really well because they did the exact same thing with wet gas that they did with dry gas. They drove the price into the ground. Now, why did they do that? That was the question I kept asking in the very beginning. I was like, I don't understand why you guys aren't shutting in these wells. And nobody had a good answer for me because traditionally, in order to stabilize prices, and one of the gas companies would shut in production. They would just wait, let the price stable, and go on. These companies, when I pulled the financial statements for the first time, I recognized why they weren't shutting in. They weren't shutting in because they were too highly leveraged and they had absolutely no cash. Usually oil and gas companies were cash cash. They sit on a mountain of cash. These companies could not be shale companies. And so they were drilling to meet um, debt service. Essentially, they could not meet debt service without keeping this production going. And they were also drilling to meet production targets. And when you're doing that, then you just keep drilling and drilling and drilling and, and it just drives the price right into the ground. They did the same thing with NGLs. So now you have an NGL market that's very, very cheap indeed. Um, so I don't know if that covers what we were asking, but. Yeah, you have a slide on um, energy return on energy investment, and I was wondering how how much of the life, uh, what cycle is that looking at? Is it from is it just production, or is it actually delivery to the retail customer? You know what? That's a good question. I don't because know because one of the things is if it's just production, then it, it's not talking about the pipeline that has to be built. And, that's a very good point. I don't know. I can find that out for you, but off the top of my head, I don't remember. Um, so, sorry. Thank you for being here. I've been reading this all week, your paper, and um, enjoying it. And uh, I wanted to have you maybe address a little bit more. You mentioned twice that. Uh, this is a favorable, favorable business climate. The shale and the drillers are um, exempt from all major federal environmental statutes. Would you talk about that a little bit more? I'd like to share this information and I'd like to be able to defend it. Yeah. Um, the oil and gas industry is exempt from all major environmental statutes in this country. They're exempt from clean air, clean drinking water, they're exempt from everything. Um, and the CERCLA Act. In fact, that's kind of interesting. If they weren't exempt from the CERCLA Act, every one of these CAD sites has the potential, depending on which chemicals they use, to be a Superfund site. Every single CAD site has the potential, depending on the chemicals that they use. But they're exempt from the CERCLA Act. So, somebody's going to have to clean that up someday, because, um, and it isn't going to be the oil and gas companies, almost certainly. So, um, that's another external cost. Um, in 2005, I think it was, uh, Dick Cheney, they, it, it, it's known as the Halliburton loophole. 
and they changed some of the laws. And I'm trying to think what it was called. Does anybody know? Does anybody remember? Yeah. Energy Policy Act. I think that was it. Yeah. And um, it it made a very it, it created a very very favorable climate for oil and gas. And I think they saw shales on the horizon and they wanted to set the stage to make it as easy as possible to go in because clearly there was going to be a problem. You know, here's an interesting um, aside about, about this. Uh, clean drinking water and shales. We hear a lot about water, and I, I don't want to go into the environmental aspects of water, but this is interesting. George Mitchell was the father of fracking, so to speak. He was Mitchell Energy, and uh, his company was Mitchell Energy. And um, he died about, I don't know, four months ago, I guess, by an elderly man, about 94 years of age. And George Mitchell, um, his foundation, the head of his foundation, actually wrote an op-ed which was published in my hometown paper, and it was very, very interesting, and I would encourage all of you to go and pull it off the internet. Fort Worth Star Telegram, George Mitchell op-ed. Um, because he basically said, this isn't being done the way it ought to be done. And they are not protecting the drinking water the way it ought to be protected. And I think, I don't have any proof of this, I did not talk to Mr. Mitchell before he died, but I think that he was an older man who felt like, oh my God, this is going to be my legacy. And he saw a problem. And so he started speaking out about it in the last months of his life. And I found that very poignant, actually. Um, but yes, they're exempt from every major environmental statute in the country. You know, and I think we've actually done them a disservice, frankly. Um, because if you go out to the oil and gas side, they haven't had to modernize the way other industries have modernized. And everybody, you know, I've got friends in the petrochemical industry, and they talk about, oh yeah, you know, we, we bitch and complain, I'm sorry, but that's what they say. We bitch and complain every time they say they're going to give us new rules. But then you know what we do? We go back and we start thinking about it, and we start thinking, I can beat this, I can make this work, not beat it, but I can make this work, I can make money doing it this way. And then they raise the bar a little bit higher and a little bit higher. We've not made the oil and gas industry do that. And so if you go out to a drill site, yeah, you'll see some fancy new, you know, I mean, hydrofracking, the, the actual horizontal drilling is new technology, and it's pretty impressive. It's, it's darn impressive. But seismic, it's, it's relatively new technology. But other than that, they haven't done much for the last 40 years. I mean, the pad site, look, you saw the picture up there with the frac trucks. It, it's a heavy industrial site, and, and there's diesel smoke billowing out everywhere. And they could use electric drill rigs, they won't use them because the margins are too thin on shales and they've never made money, so they won't use the pollution control devices. EPA actually estimates that most pollution control devices for shales uh, would pay for themselves in less than a year, but the industry won't use them. So. Well, I don't agree, first of all, that the oil and gas industry gets a big tax base and other, other manufacturers, other corporations don't get. They get to deduct their operating costs and exploration costs, things like that. So what's the deal? Mm -hmm. you, you, you tell me that they're, they're, what's their average tax rate? I couldn't answer that. I would have to go in and, and pull the, the annual report. I think Exxon paid about one year they had to move. You know, sure. Chastised to make as much money. They paid about $50 billion in total income tax. And how much did they make, sir? Well, when they, did they twice that hundred billion? Whatever. Well, yeah. I'm just for, for I'm, I'm, I'm just stating that the subsidies for oil and gas, especially globally, are astonishing. Well, like what? So, uh, I believe they are 1.6 trillion dollars annually. So, what? What are they? What are they for? Given the exempt for these across the board. I mean, there are quite a number. I, I, I'm not sure that I can sit here. What? And do what? what? For what? Uh, um, I'm giving you the figures. I will be more than happy if you would like to leave me your name and address. I will be more than happy to give you the breakdown. I've given you the figures. Okay. Absolutely, the five Do they just get tax? Do they just get subsidies for for being there, or is it for they get tax subsidies? They get um, depreciation. Okay, allowance. depreciation. Everybody gets depreciation. They get. Um, well, uh, you get accelerated depreciation. Okay. 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 Okay
It's the old education of the world. Okay. Okay. But no, there's no place in this. By the way, Exxon has never made $50 billion annually. How much do they invest? You know that? How much do they have invested? Return on investment. You know what it was? Probably about 8%. At that time, you get 8% of the bank. They got professional managers getting paid six, seven figures to manage funds, and they don't understand what they're investing in. Now, there's an action that says if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. Then it was the bankers. But on one side, we got these brilliant bankers that are ruling the companies into MA deals so they can make billions of dollars on there. On the other hand, we've got you, you said bankers with only money on these unproven reserves. So we got stupid bankers on one side, we've got brilliant bankers on the other side. According to your states. No, wait, repeat that last thing again. You say that. We have, you have, you start off saying these brilliant bankers. No, not you just said brilliant. You said these, these uh, I said, Wall Street doesn't bankers were literally these. These companies into into like these uh, M and A deals, so they can they can sell off they can sell off their investments, and, and they, they can get big fees for packaging these deals. So that's what I've got. These brilliant bankers fooling these these gas investors. Do you the, understand how the capital markets work? Oh, okay, yes. Explain to me how the capital markets work, please. You, 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 explain to me how the capital markets work. You're, you're accusing me of not understanding. No, you, I said you didn't understand. You told us. You told us. You don't understand how the capital markets work. You told us the great fighters. You don't understand the definition of how the capital markets work. I'm not going to even try. But I was, I was, I was involved in this, uh, well, this, uh, what if your return's been on shares? What? What if your return's been on shares? I don't know how you do the shares. You said you're a banker in this. I didn't say it had to do with shale, by shale investments or shale by Okay, can you give us a definition of how the capital markets work, please? No, I won't. <laughs> but you know what? You, 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 you told us that these bikers lured him and made him deals. We have a, and then, okay, just now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, America has made a habit of going to other countries and um, setting up their energy operations. Would you discuss uh, what is happening now with the companies coming to America and the selling of the assets like Chesapeake and the, um, the leases in Arkansas in particular? Uh, and what company and you know, what nation they're from and the various nations that are now invested in the U.S. and now that's changing the whole dynamic of our ownership in this country. I don't know, <coughs> I've got, I think I've found some of these numbers and you can go back to that, but I don't know um, exactly how much, I don't think 